so as we discussed in the overall presentation, program year 2020-2021 is a five-year consolidated plan year, which means that activities are ordered a bit different from prior years. The main impact is that the city was unable to issue a NOPA earlier because the five-year strategies had not yet been adopted by city council. However, city council did adopt both the plans on May 21st, including approved projects. Applications for specific activities that meet the objectives of those approved projects are being requested and are the subject of this NOPA. Note that multiple applications may be approved for funding for each project. The projects that were approved as part of the 2020-2021 plans, which are included in this specific application for public and community services, are nonprofit public services described as CDBG funds used to provide to local nonprofits to support programs that serve predominantly low and moderate income clientele. $161,000 of CDBG funding is available for these activities. And micro enterprise assistance, which is described as financial assistance, technical assistance, or general support services to owners and developers of micro enterprises. A micro enterprise is a business with five or fewer employees including the owners. $35,000 of funding is available for these activities. And please note that there are very specific requirements for microenterprise assistance. So applicants considering submitting an application for these activities are strongly recommended to contact us to make sure the activities being included in the application are eligible under HUD guidelines. Please note that programming for homeless proposals should be submitted on the homeless and homelessness prevention application We'll have a meeting about that tomorrow and that fair housing programs will be requested through a separate process at a date to be determined. The 2020-2024 consolidated plan included a new set of strategic priorities and the following activities were prioritized. After school enrichment programs for children to include educational and recreational programming, enhanced programming for children and youth in existing parks and recreation centers, Affordable child care and daycare options, particularly for parents engaged in the work fair course or who are enrolled in job training programs. Job training to include assistance with job search and interview skills. Educational activities for adults around job skills and employment to improve employment options. Incentive programs for entrepreneurs and local businesses that create new jobs. Recreation, nutrition, and social services for seniors. Counseling and recovery programs for people with alcohol and or substance abuse disorders, services to assist victims of domestic violence, and services to assist children who have been victims of abuse. Uh, please note that some of these activities may, it may be a little uh, confusing to suss out if you should be using uh, possibly the homeless and homelessness prevention application. Uh, or the public services application. So if you're not sure, uh, again, please feel free to reach out to us. With that, I will hand it over to Austin Robinson, Program Manager for CDBG Public and Community Services Programs with the Housing and Community Development Division to go over the program overview. Hello again, everybody. Um, with this program overview, just hope that uh, it's a little bit less overwhelming than the, the total overview of all programs included. And so hope we can get more specified information and leave this with any a bit more info. Okay. First, uh, public and community services are an essential component to a comprehensive community development strategy. Public service activities not only provide direct benefits to those assisted, but also serve to link, to link other CDBG investments such as economic development, public facilities, and housing activities together for a stronger impact. We've previously made an example of this uh, in the overview slides. Uh, Bill mentioned how we like to send different organizations through a previous subrecipient, Hope Builds, for different contract services or community businesses or Section 3 requirements for procurement. And this is just an example of some ways we just like to link together everyone who's been awarded and uh, keep that process going and engaged. Public and community service objectives. The primary objective of this program is the development of viable communities achieved by providing the following principally for persons and areas 
of persons of low and moderate income and presumed benefit. There's decent housing, suitable living environment, and expanded economic opportunities. Below, we have a few examples of previous subrecipients. As I mentioned, Hope Helping Others Pursue Excellence Builds Job Training Program, as well as Stone Soup Career Development and Training, the Boys and Girls Club After School Program, and Fresno Economic Opportunities Commission at the OC Street Saints After School Program. It's just a couple of youth services as well as micro enterprise assistance programs that we've held previously. Moving forward, I'm going to go over the eligible activities and costs, which hopefully this can help you to delineate between uh, the public services and the micro enterprise programs. Um, eligibility information. In order to receive funding, a proposed activity must consist of eligible activities, provide benefit to eligible persons, include only eligible costs according to federal requirements address a priority area in the five-year consolidated plan, and qualify under one of the approved projects in the annual action plan. Below is linked again to our um, housing site for more information on eligibility provided in the NOFA handbook, which is also very important and provides a lot of information on this process. Going forward, eligibility requirements. Only nonprofit and local government organizations are eligible to apply for public service grants. Organizations must be incorporated under state law and have the 501c3 designation, which again is the portion of the US Internal Revenue Code that allows the federal tax exemption of nonprofit organizations, specifically those that are considered public charities, private foundations, or private operating foundations. And applicants must also demonstrate the ability to comply with all Department of Housing and Urban Development rules and regulations. Uh, next, we just have a list of the eligible activities that classify as public services. It's not limited to this. So we have employment services, which is job training, which goes under micro enterprise, it's crime prevention and public safety, child care, health services, substance abuse services, fair housing, counseling, education programs, energy conservation services for senior citizens, services for homeless persons, welfare services, down payment assistance, and recreational services. More eligible costs. Eligible expenses are direct costs directly associated with program delivery, which is admin costs, salaries, and program supplies. Costs associated with outreach to residents are allowable program costs as well. This is usually a cost incurred by like um, newer organizations to make sure they get up and running and, and maintain the program year to grant year. Next, we have a list of ineligible costs. These are included but not limited to fundraising, entertainment, alcoholic beverages, deposits on equipment, incentives to clients, gift cards, raffle prizes, holiday gift prizes for social activities, and late fees for penalties. So I, I do want to note real quick um, uh, that there is one more eligible cost, um, and that is uh, indirect costs. Um, however, we have, uh, after looking at the amount of funds available for uh, the FY 2021 um, action plan, in public services, we are we are uh, going to be likely to prioritize applications that include mostly direct costs, uh, but indirect costs are eligible as well. Yeah, along with that point, indirect costs, the de minimis for that is usually 10% for organizations that have not previously been approved for um, indirect costs with other federal programs. We went over ineligible costs, correct? And uh, next we have meeting a, na a national objective. To be eligible for CDBG funding, public service program project must meet a national objective. There are three CDBG national objectives. These are benefit to low to moderate income persons, prevention and elimination of slums and blight, 
for meeting a particularly urgent community development need. Public service activities may qualify as meeting a national objective as depicted in the chart on the following slide. So here we have a breakdown of how each objective qualifies and a specific example for public services. I'd like to take a look at this. We can start from the top. The low to moderate income area benefit is residents to particularly primary residential area and at least 51% of those are low to moderate income persons. Operation, an example of this is the operation of an after school program for children attending elementary school serving a predominant, predominantly low to moderate income area. This, this service area is determined by myself, city staff, as well as our, um, our, our uh, internally generated maps. So we're able to document the residents within a half mile radius to ensure that everyone surrounding the operating facility is low to moderate income. Next, we have the low to moderate income limited clientele. This qualifying national objective is um, limited to a specific group of people, at least 51% of those who are low to moderate income persons. Services qualifying under this category serve a specific clientele rather than providing service, services to all the persons in a geographic area. So this will be programs that have intake applications that qualify each person who is a beneficiary of the program, certifying they are low to moderate income. This would be an example of provision of meals to the homeless. Most public services qualify under this category. So there are some, there's, there are some instances where income documentation is not required. This is under presumed benefits, which homelessness is one of those. The low to moderate income housing and income jobs are not applicable. And uh, down towards the bottom, we have slum or blighted area. This is a public service provided within a designated slum or blighted area and is designated to address one or more conditions which contributed to the deterioration of the area. An example of this would be provision of crime prevention counseling to residents of a designated slum or blight area. And finally, we have urgent needs. This is a public service designed to alleviate existing conditions that pose a, pose a serious and immediate threat to health or welfare of the community. They are of recent origin or recently became urgent and the grant recipient is unable to find other available funds to support the activity. This would be something, the time frame on this is generally, I believe, within about 12 months. This would be maybe um, post uh, natural disaster. Uh, addition, or an example of this is additional police protection to prevent looting in an area damaged by a tornado. Moving on, we have a little bit more information on national objective qualifications. For low income area benefit, we um, identify boundaries of service area. And like I mentioned before, the city generates a map data of the surrounding residents in a half mile radius, the service area to determine if at least 51% of people living in the area have low to moderate income. Next, we have the low to moderate income clientele option. Under limited clientele, services are targeted to low and moderate income persons. This is earning less than 80% of the area median income or people who are presumed to be low or moderate income, regardless of where they live. Presumed benefit examples are abused children, battered spouses, severely disabled adults, homeless persons, illiterate adults, persons with AIDS, uh, migrant, migrant farm workers. Grantees must maintain accurate and complete records for each person receiving direct assistance. Okay, moving forward, we wanna go over some documentation requirements and monitoring. Monitoring, all programs funded will be monitored at least once a year by the city for compliance with city and HUD requirements and regulation. Program requirements, including performance accomplishments, eligibility and expenditures will be included in desk reviews, as well as remote monitoring and on-site monitoring reviews. The city will provide technical assistance as needed or requested to assist the grantees to track program progress and success of efforts. So these are usually held within the beginning and towards the completion of programs. If the agency is not following the program requirements and the federal or state regulations, 
funding may be terminated and funding reimbursement is required. This also falls under the national objective. If you have to maintain a low mod clientele throughout the year, this means the intake forms must be true and correct and any intake forms that are not completed and certified, then we have to assume that the beneficiary was not low to moderate income classifications. Moving forward a little bit more detail on some of the reporting, we have the quarterly performance report. Within 30 days from the end of each quarter, grantees shall submit quarterly reports for all funded activities. This data includes racial, ethnic data, income data, if not the uh, listed pre presumed benefits, homeless status, and assessment or narratives of the performance. The reports, mu the reports must report the number of unduplicated household, per household or persons assisted. So this is not reporting the first quarter uh, beneficiaries. In addition to the second quarter beneficiaries, they should be separated. The report format will be emailed to all grantees at agreement signing. It's uh, just an Excel spreadsheet template that uh, we maintain throughout the year. On to program policies and procedures. Again, this is a reiteration of the overview and some of the things that we said in the previous webinar. Again, most importantly, these all must be written. Um, Again, applicant intake and eligibility determination. This is the verification and eligibility determination for uh, low mod clientele. Uh, approval and notification. Procurement of services and supplies. Conflict of interest. Equal opportunity and non-discrimination. These are all different documents you want to have of your program policies and procedures. Moving forward, financial policies and procedures, again, must be written. Internal controls. Um, this just defines staff qualifications and duties, lines of authorities, separations of functions. There's the determination of allowability, payment process, as well as audit requirements. And all um, Total federal funds expended in your contract year is greater than 700,000 and an audit is required. Otherwise, agency is exempt from audit. HUD recommends signed certification from the subrecipients to determine applicability. So this means that if you do <clears throat> not have a total of um, over 750,000 federal funds expended in a year, then we just want signed certification that this is true as well as proof. Additional financial procedures to consider when submitting reimbursements or incurring costs that you wish to be reimbursed. Are these costs allowable? So this, um, sticking to budget, this is, um, does your agency have a clearly defined set of standards and procedures for determining the reasonableness, allowability, and allocability of costs incurred? So just maintaining that consistency with the program outline. Are costs reasonable? What a prudent person would pay, good procurement records will support this. And are all costs allocable? Expenditures must directly relate to the funded program. For costs split between programs, indicate the split and rationale. I'll hand it over to Ed. now. Thanks so much, Austin. So this, um, this section, I have kind of a very quick overview of the application process, as I know, uh, pretty much all of you were on the um, uh, call this morning. Um, so the Housing and Community Development Division website contains all the application materials, including the NOFA handbook, which goes into more detail about the programs, requirements, and the application process. So that's your home base for application. All, applicant, uh, all applicants should submit one NOFA application part A, which includes organization information. Some of the items required are presented here, some of which may take your organization some time to prepare. Again, I'll draw your attention to the resolution of board of directors authorizing the application and naming the person or persons authorized to sign the application. Giving you a little bit more time on that one, the NOFA applications are due June 22nd. 
that one needs to come in uh, by July 7th before we make our recommendations based on the scoring. Um, the uh, all applicants should submit one or more application part B, which includes all of the details of a specific program for which you're requesting funding. Uh, applicants are encouraged to attach up to two letters of support. Again, you can submit more a part B for different programs. You could have one homeless uh, application part B and one public services part B, but you only need one application part A. Again, here's the application timeline. The full tentative timeline is presented here. Applications are due June 22nd, after which we'll score the applications based on the criteria presented therein um, and make recommendations. And the target date for city council consideration of the subrecipient agreements is August 20th, 2020, followed by the issuance of notices of grant awards. Again, I'll reiterate this timeline is heavily affected by the fact that um, we're in a five-year consolidated planning year, which means the NOFA didn't come out until after the consolidated plan and annual action plan were adopted by City Council on May 21st. And also some of those hearings were postponed while the city adjusted to virtual participation requirements that were still being determined um, under the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we're making every effort to try to move this timeline along as quickly as possible. Application submission, as in years past, applications are due by 4 p.m. on the submission deadline. Uh, postmarks are not accepted. Organizations are asked to submit one signed application and one digital copy of their application. Uh, you're encouraged to mail your application in well in advance. Call or email us to let us know they're on the way. Um, and if you're planning to deliver in person, let us know at least 24 hours in advance to arrange receipt. Um, that's all on account of the COVID-19 pandemic is we're not entirely sure what public access to City Hall will look like. So if you just call us 24 hours in advance, we'll make sure to coordinate it accordingly to make sure that we can get your application. That is, if you're planning to submit in person, of course, we'd recommend that you get that in the mail a few days in advance and, and shoot us an email to let us know it's on the way. Uh, three options for submitting digitally. I'll go over those again real quick. Emails, if your attachment's under 40 megabytes. Great option because you have a record of the submission. You can also include a flash drive with your physical submission, um, or you can use the new upload tool. Um, the instructions for how to use that FTP upload tool are included in the handbook. So that's if you're if you have something that's over 40 megabytes or you prefer not to email it, that's an option. You can upload your your document to the city's FTP. It'll give you a link, and then you copy and paste that into an email and send that to us. Again, any questions on the submissions, please feel free to give us a call um, at 621-8300 or send us an email at hcdd at fresno.gov. Additional support um, is available. Applicants may schedule one-on-one -on -one consultation with program manager Austin Robinson for the period from June 8th through June 12th. I think he said some other folks have already reached out to him, so that's great. Um, please contact him in advance of, um, of that time frame to schedule a consultation because we know there's a lot of demand for these, um, uh, for these applications. Uh, for general inquiries, please uh, email us at hcdd at fresno.gov. And with that, uh, we are going to have our Q&A session. We'll open it up for questions. If you'd like to ask a question and are signed into the Zoom application, you can add yourself to the queue by selecting the icon labeled participants at the bottom center of your screen. And in the window that opens, click the label raise hand. If you are joined by phone, select star nine. That will add you to the queue. And uh, we will go in turn uh, by order of uh, request to speak and unmute you so that you can ask your question. So with that, I'll wait a minute or two to see if we've got any questions coming in. Okay, uh, looks like we have a question from Jan Minami. So I'm gonna go ahead and allow you to come off mute. Yes, yes. thank you. Um, is there a place? Okay, I'm echoing. I don't we'll go know. Ahead and, I will mute our, our end and see if that. Okay. Does that help? I guess it does. Yep, you sound good to us. <laughs> okay. Um, 
is there a place where we can get samples of policies? Is there anything where we can get more specific on the policies that you um, recommend? I mean, I know the general parameters, but any specific policies, samples, for instance? Okay, thanks so much for that question. And uh, we have Bill Kubel on the line. Bill, do you have any recommendations on where yeah, we might- hi, everybody. I would say uh, we, we, if you're looking for an entire set of policies and procedures, I don't know if we would be uh, able to provide that. But if you had one specifically like conflict of interest or uh, procurement, for example, we could definitely give you an example and give you some, some key points that we would like to see. Jan, I've unmuted you again. Um, did you... Did that answer your question? If, if, if we were able to get you some of those samples or are there specific ones that you were looking for? Oh, I think, I think you have to click unmute. Okay. Um, we, gotcha. uh, we have most of those policies. I believe we may have everything. I just wanna be sure that what we have meets your requirements. So thank you, Bill. Yeah, sure. Um, we, uh, if you want us to take a look at it ahead of time, we, we definitely can, especially if you have something um, concerns. Typically, we don't review the policies and procedures until we do the on-site monitoring, which is way after, you know, it can be a full year after you get your award. But yeah, if you, if you want to provide those to us, um, you know, once you get your award, we can, we can, we would be happy to review those and see if we see any specific in issues. Great. Does that answer yep. your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right. It looks like we have um, another question from uh, Diane Carbre. So I'm going to go ahead and allow you the opportunity to unmute yourself. I think you just have to click unmute. It should hopefully pop up. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Yes. I was looking at the total funding pool and it's um, 161000 um, and I put it in the chat box too. Is there any priority over after school capital projects? What, what is, I mean, that's not a lot of money for the whole CDBG. And so I'm trying to figure out how to best pose a grant ask. Hi, Diane. Oops, let me unmask. Hi, Diane. This is Tom Morgan. How are you today? Hey, Tom. How's it going? Good. So the 161 is for public services. We're actually not doing nonprofit facility improvements in this cycle. Okay. So that's all for public services. Yeah, I would also say that council directly funded parks after school and senior hot mills. So you're not competing against other city departments for this public service fund. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. Sure. All right, does that answer your question, Diane? Yes. Thank you. So I will uh, hold for a minute here and see if anybody else has any questions. Looks like we have one more question from uh, Victor Chavez. So Victor, I'm gonna go ahead and allow you to speak. You can now unmute yourself. Okay, uh, can you hear me? We can, yes. Okay, so following up on the last question and answer, so is it correct? Oh, Round, there is no funding for, for public infrastructure and facilities. Funding for, uh, excuse me, Victor, this is Tom Morgan again. The funding for public infrastructure has uh, been committed to city projects. So there is no nonprofit facility improvements. Okay. Uh, funding being offered through this action plan. 
or through these no Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, do we, and if we have any other questions, and pause for just a moment. Looks like we've still got plenty of time. If you've got another question, happy to help you out. All right, so I don't see any further questions. Um, at this time, we will we'll say thank you. And um, again, if you think of anything that we have not discussed or uh, as you're filling out the application, something comes to mind that you hadn't thought of in advance, feel free to, um, to email us at hcdd at fresno.gov. Um, or contact your program manager as listed in your um, application or the NOFA handbook. We are here to help um, and we appreciate your time today. Um, with that, I'll say thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.